the odds of, of success in the game bare bones is slim to none, right? We're talking single digit percentage of uh, success. And when you're adding uh, more pressure to that equation, right? More risk, more demands from users that potentially don't even care about the game. All they care is about, look, I have a bag and I want it to go up, right? Can, can devs do something about this? Uh, then that dilutes uh, your, your focus, right? Then really, who are your core stakeholders at, at the end of the day? Uh, becomes a question, right? Are we optimizing for the asset owners uh, as our first power users? Or no, are we optimizing for future players that potentially don't even know uh, who we are and what we're trying to do, but we'll find the game fun. Hey everyone, welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dead, joined here by my co-host from 4RC Nomadic. Today's show spotlights a new studio designed to accelerate the advent of Web3 gaming called Jungle. Jungle develops and publishes hybrid games that are mobile first and blockchain enabled. In this episode, we interview the co-founder and CEO, Joao Baraldo about the process of procuring, developing, and re-releasing gaming IP, including why Jungle believes Web3 elements can ultimately lead to a better gaming experience. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. For most of us, our crypto journey started with MetaMask. And now with MetaMask Portfolio, we can do so much more. MetaMask Portfolio puts you in control. Use the dashboard to see all your assets and balances across your wallets in one place. The buy feature allows us to buy crypto assets effortlessly with fiat options such as PayPal or credit card. The swap feature allows us to swap any tokens anytime by finding a selection of available rates. The bridge feature allows us to bridge between networks, including Ethereum, L1s, and L2s, based on the best price and fastest delivery time. And with the stake feature, anyone in a few clicks can stake ETH and earn rewards. Do more in Web3 your way with a safe, simple, and convenient tool that's all in one place. Track and manage your Web3 everything at metamask.io slash portfolio. Whether you're a trader, farmer, analyst, or newbie, you can trade smart with KyberSwap, the OG decentralized exchange and aggregator on 13 chains. Swap at the best rates, farm with real yields, set limit orders, use their proprietary trading and AI tools with the best UX in DeFi, securely and permissionlessly. Get better rates, better opportunities, better alpha, and a better trading experience. Trade smart now at kyberswap.com. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees, UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains in USDC and native access to Instadap's powerful, custom DeFi strategies. Avocado, one wallet to rule all chains. All right, so before we get started, just a bit of background about Joao before we introduce him. Uh, Joao Baraldo had two years previously in venture at a multi-stage fund based out of Europe with $1 billion in assets under management. He was the Web3 gaming lead at Wild Wildlife Studios a mobile gaming publisher valued at $3 billion. And today he is the founder and CEO at Jungle, and they are working on their first game for the win, which is a mobile first person shooter title. So Joao, welcome to the Edge podcast. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk about everything Jungle and what we're uh, working on. Crypto has likely just survived another bear market, and uh, we are going to see a lot more excitement and interest, I think, pour into the Web3 gaming space. But uh, you're at the forefront of really just making the, the most fun games that happen to incorporate uh, Web3 elements. And so just really excited to kind of learn from some of the lessons um, that you've taken uh, uh, over the last few years here. So before we talk more about that and almost like the private equity-like process behind Jungle uh, in terms of how you go about uh, ultimately acquiring IP and then making a, a killer game out of that. Uh, would love to just kind of talk through a bit more about your background. I, I gave a short summary there, but yeah, anything else you, you'd like to tell us about 
um, how you got into gaming, how you got into crypto, and, and why are you working at the intersection of both? Yeah, for sure. So I'm originally from Brazil. Um, that's where I grew up, but I spent the better um, part of the last decade in Europe between the UK, Belgium, France, and actually started my career on the venture side uh, in 2019 at a fund that had heavy exposure into mobile gaming. So that was actually my first uh, exposure uh, to the industry through the other side of the table. And it was a fascinating experience uh, to learn exactly how these companies were started, how they uh, scaled, how they monetized, and later how they exited. So by the time that I came into the market, Mobile free to play was already already at a point of near peak saturation, right? Most of the pitches that we were receiving at the time were from experts of the genre that had done it multiple times over and were now jumping over to start their own journey outside of big studios, right? And for me, a lot of the themes that I saw in the market back then were still about this N plus one innovation uh, to gaming, right? It wasn't about taking a lot of creative risk. It wasn't about uh, doing something necessarily that the builders believed in, but it was more so trying to stick to a proven formula and potentially change, you know, less than twenty percent, uh, so that you had some kind of edge. But you're really doing cookie cutter approach to to games, and that was for me something that was really creatively uninspiring, right? So uh, although that was the biggest part of the industry for me it always lacked some kind of creative risk associated with it to uh, be worthwhile for me to, to pursue it uh, but that uh, changed when I uh, first came across web free gaming uh, back in 2020 uh, I started looking at how different founders were pursuing this idea this new model that at the time was still unproven uh, but for me uh, included a bunch of new directions that got me thinking and got me excited about what the next decade of gaming uh, was going to look like. So uh, by the summer of 2021, 20, uh, when we had the Axie run and a bunch of other projects were coming to the surface, uh, I felt that that market that we had initially assessed in 2020 as some kind of uh, risky niche uh, was about to, uh, to really take off. And that for me was the trigger uh, to lead the, the, the fund and uh, be part of this new wave as it was getting uh, segmented. So I then had the opportunity to join Wildlife Studios, uh, which is a big mobile gaming uh, studio and publisher out of Brazil, backed by, by Benchmark, Bessemer, and a few other Silicon Valley firms. And at the time, they were putting together uh, the inception of a web free strategy and trying to... Uh, spin up a new team inside of the uh, of the platform that was only going to look at this this market and figure out an approach for product experimentation and growth uh, in, in Web3. So that was my jump into Web3 Gaming. I did that for uh, most of 2022, up to a point where I realized there was a much bigger uh, opportunity hidden at Plague Fight for me, which was to bundle up all that I had learned from venture and then from operating in gaming to do my own thing, right? To start a new company that uh, was going to be different uh, in many ways uh, that I had seen uh, from both the pitches in mobile free to play, but also uh, the wave of new web free gaming startups that were getting uh, sunded from 2021 to 2022. So that was uh, the point at which I jumped and uh, later found the jungle and uh, got to work with you guys on it. Hey, so before we talk more about jungle and, and web three gaming in general. I, I do want to dig a little bit more into your perspective working in the legacy gaming industry. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend that I, I have some sort of expertise to even comment on this other than, uh, I, I'm a gamer, obviously I enjoy playing myself and observing from the outside in, uh, what it takes to create a game, it, it just has always looked overwhelming to me. It's looked, um, although there's, I'm sure, like uh, updated methods to, you know, releasing a game, updated processes, it, it also looks like an industry that probably suffers from a lot of uh, like legacy baggage, you know, just being in an industry that has been around for decades. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like maybe like 
uh, the movie or like TV production like industry, you have all this creativity and joy, but there's still, you know, there's uh, uh, harsh realities to the business and the margins behind it. So if you're just able to summarize a bit of uh, some of the the flaws you see in that industry, and of course, this will kind of lead us into like the improvements that you're trying to make um, through Jungle. Yeah, for sure. So I think you you touch on something that is quite uh, fundamental to the industry, which is this power law, right? Uh, very much like in the movie industry, it is a hit driven uh, business uh, where a few outliers uh, dominate the charts, the uh, downloads, the installs, and uh, also revenue, right? So um, everything is really built around that fact that most projects uh, will not make it to market. And uh, even for most that do, will not scale and be proven successful over the long term, right? So uh, how that translates into kind of the practices of uh, these companies is that you're always willing to have multiple projects uh, being set up as part of a portfolio, and you're always looking for which ones uh, are going to be your winners and which ones you're uh, going to kill because um, they're not going to lead you anywhere. So very much like in venture, um, you, you need to let your your uh, winners ride and uh, double down in those uh, as opposed to trying to um, put all your uh, efforts and resources across the board, right? So for me, how that translated in, in practice is that a lot of these projects um, don't get the necessary attention uh, and the necessary uh, investment of uh, what it would take to make that a successful game, right? Most uh, games in mobile, uh, for example, uh, follow a very um, published uh, formula of how they start from a prototype, how they get scaled internally, taken to market to test early gameplay metrics, and then later get kind of extended out and, and released, right? Uh, but that is almost like a mystical process where uh, companies have very little control over, you know, how they can manufacture a, uh, a hit, right? Uh, they know it when they see it, but up until then, it's a lot of trial and error. And for me, that is something that presents both a great challenge internally, right? You see a company like Supercell go years without uh, releasing because their expectation for release is now incredibly high and they're not willing to uh, put in the time potentially to get, um, you know, a game that is not quite there yet uh, and have it cross over to, to being a hit. Uh, but also it presents opportunities, right? It presents uh, a a wide uh, portfolio of games that uh, get killed prematurely and um, they never see uh, all the way to, to to release, right? Potential games that are killed uh, not on the, the merits of the game itself, but rather because they are not well positioned for the platform and the business model or the monetization strategy isn't quite there, right? So I think this is the, the biggest uh, insight when you start looking at these companies that just the, the sheer number of games that uh, it takes before you, you release something and you have a hit is, is multiple orders of magnitude on the other side, right? It, it's wild to think like, you know, kind of touching on that creative side, you can have teams working on a project or a title for a year or years even, and then to find out that, oh, hey, it's, it's probably not going to make it. We're just going to pull the plug right here. I mean, that's got to be just like, you know, so demoralizing if I'm putting myself in the shoes of like a creative person or a developer that's, you know, put a lot into into one of these games. Um, I want to just switch gears here and talk a little bit about the the approach behind Jungle Studio, because um, as, as you alluded to, 4RC, Fourth Revolution Capital, are investors in Jungle. And when we first saw your pitch, it was very interesting and kind of like, unlike anything we had seen really. Um, so maybe speak to this Web2 acquisition structure a little bit more. And and just kind of hearing more about your background, it's just it's just funny how kind of like perfectly suited you are to this, working on both sides of like the venture side and the game development side. So yeah, maybe speak to how that came to be and um, just a little bit more about it. 
Yeah. So yeah, as you point out, um, this acquisition led growth is um, almost the perfect intersection, right, of private equity and gaming. And for us, it really comes out of this analysis that we're just talking about, right? Realizing that um, there are tons of projects with extremely high potential, but that for some reason, uh, usually uh, for the unit economics of free-to-play, get killed at some point along their development journey, right? Games that potentially have super high user engagement, high retention, but can't quite figure out uh, some part of the, the the business model before they're they're killed internally. And these companies have limited resources that they need to be allocating uh, to projects that they believe or that the metrics show have already kind of de-risked, right? So in that gray zone, uh, I think you see tons of projects that got uh, a lot of investment, a lot of dedication, and a lot of love from mm-hmm. their original development team, uh, but now uh, have run out of steam and are looking for some kind of uh, bridge over or some kind of... Um, support to to be able to uh to, to cross that that chasm and so for us uh we saw that machinery intern- internally at uh, wildlife at other companies and in that we realized that there was a market there of distress assets that could be acquired that could be transacted uh over and that uh, for a company that was just starting out was a massive leapfrog in terms of timing and in terms of investment, if you just get access uh, to the right IP and to the right projects, right? So we built uh, the company on that as a starting point, right? What if instead of looking at starting a gaming company from scratch and also taking a new game from pre-production all the way to release, we could accelerate out uh, and go directly to the window prior to release, right? We could uh, underwrite that risk, look at the metrics of the game, and be able to make a calculated assessment of whether we believe uh, in that uh, project's potential and more importantly, whether we had pieces that could uh, solve the issues that the original developer had identified, right? But the problem space was already mapped out to you know a much uh, more complete extent than if you're starting with this embryonic idea that you need to develop and hire people for, and then that will evolve as you start executing, right? And by year two, by year three, it's a completely different thing, right? So for us, it was optimizing around time and trying to accelerate as much as possible and get to the publishing moment as the point where uh, gaming companies really realize uh, profit and uh, add the most value um, to to their enterprises. Joao, can you talk more about how do you begin to assess distressed gaming IP, and maybe you could even give some examples of like opportunities you see uh, in today's market, um, whether or not those are Web3 games already. I, I think what I really want to get to is how you begin to identify uh, IP that you would um, work on and, and optimize and repackage. And then how does like Web3 actually help to solve any of their problems? their issues. Yeah, for sure. So I think a lot of it is the same uh, if you're looking at a uh, venture lens and assessing content risk, right? First, you're going to do a diligence on the product by itself and you're going to play the game and you're, you're going to look at it uh, as a player and see, is this something that I can see myself playing that uh, I find uh, intrinsically fun and that I recognize there is a, a quality, there's a loop here that uh, is engaging. Right, that that is always, I think, the the first test firms, and that's what we did with our first game. Then later, uh, it's really about making a diagnosis of it, right? It's and trying to extrapolate out not just the product, but the market uh, side of the equation, right? So, if we have something internally that we think is is promising, what does the actual market opportunity uh, tell us about um, you know the competition in the genre, the acquisition costs, and really the the future uh, development of, of the segment, right? What is, how big is the the player audience, and how can we uh, actually have an edge in developing a game for this for this audience? So, in putting those two together, you start uh, coming up with ideas, right? Of like, what are the improvements? What are the current problems that we want to fix? And what are the opportunities here that if we were to change its design, if we were to change its product strategy, then 
you have something new in your hands that hasn't yet been tested and potentially has a bigger uh, opportunity than the original team had originally envisioned, right? Uh, I think a lot of this is uh, following intuition. Uh, you can't necessarily at the diligence uh, process start testing all of these ideas out. But as players and builders, you start to get a good grasp of you know, what would actually move the needle here, right? If we were to invest only in one aspect of this game with um, a new team on board, uh, how much uh, can we can we change the structure and how would that actually manifest in an in, IP in with, with bigger potential uh, commercially later down the line? Um, so that was the uh, process for us. Uh, it took quite a while for us to uh, think through uh, the design space of this game. It is um, something that, right, we don't stop after diligence and we kind of crystallize a vision and never look back. We're constantly evolving or thinking around uh, not just this game, but the shooter market and what uh, hasn't been uh, tested in, in, in this space. So that is a continuous process, but for us just narrowing down that focus from the very beginning saying, okay, you have a fixed genre and you have very limited constraints of what to work with. That is already a massive advantage, right? It instills focus right out of the gate and uh, pulls everyone around a, a specific uh, project that uh, you've already kind of uh, developed, uh, you know, uh, out, outside of the company, but gives you a really solid structure to, to operate with it. Joel, one thing I've been thinking through is you. So you're already down the road developing, redeveloping, I guess, this IP that that you acquired. To me, like thinking through that, like you've you've inherited some level of like technical debt here. It's like a creative process that was started by others that now you're taking at a certain point in its life cycle or roadmap and, and you're taking it over the finish line. To me, like I, I'm walking through like, okay, what if I were to, you know, grab somebody's partly finished essay and try to write it and get it to the finish line? Has that process of taking, I guess, work from others and and making it your own been more difficult or about what you expected or maybe even less challenging than you expected? Can you can you speak to that process a little bit? Yeah, it's it's always more difficult than you imagine at the outset, right? Uh, I think a lot of companies are started with a question uh, at the very core, which is how hard can it be, right? Um, so I think a, a good estimation is always it's going to be 10x plus harder uh, than you think at the beginning. Uh, but the difficulty isn't necessarily because of the legacy work that the original development team had done. It's everything else around you uh, going through that journey now yourself, right? So uh, actually, it's uh, incredibly um, clarity-inducing to have something already developed to the extent that we inherited because you start seeing some of the design choices that were made that potentially were uh, decisions made out of you know a tunnel vision that the team um, was fixed on and didn't want to change, but you start looking from this external perspective then you start questioning some of the assumptions that uh, potentially you know it wasn't possible before uh, but very much like taking a project from zero uh, you need to develop that for yourself right and, and you got into a second tunnel vision uh going uh trying to cut across some of those problems right and it, it is about articulating that vision to the team having a product strategy and both trying to produce that clarity of what we're trying to do, but also being fluid enough that your vision is allowed to evolve with time, right? And with any game of this complexity, like what we're building, it is thousands of pieces coming together, right? Across engineering, across art, uh, across design, and you're trying to put all of that together in a package that produces this nebulous formula we call fun, right? So it is always uh, tricky uh, to kind of assess the progress and it's it's never linear right i think this is something that uh, for us was uh, a challenge in the first few months of trying to accelerate as much as possible and not seeing that uh that uh, uh acceleration right out of the gate right but now three quarters uh of um of operation uh, behind our backs we're now finally starting to see some of the uh discussions we've, we've had and some of the decisions we've made uh, show 
uh, a payout, right? And we're only really getting started in, in the journey of really making this game as good as it can be. So um, it is longer, it is more challenging, but it's extremely fulfilling as well. And this is something that only happens once you've built out the studio and you really get into a rhythm of creative collaboration with um, with your peers. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. Awesome. Um, I promise we will get to the game for the win soon here, but uh, while, like, while we have you, we just want to pick your brain a little bit more about the industry and would, would love to get your perspective just on, I guess, the process of building in Web3 elements into a Web2 game um, and just working with Web3, um, just the challenges that go into that and any insights you can kind of provide behind that whole piece. Yeah, the the biggest challenge for us um, is everything el- externally uh, outside of the studio, right? And uh, Web3 over the last year has been extremely challenging simply for the downside volatility that we've experienced, right? And at that point, uh, where everything else is changing and Web3 is still trying to find its its core, right? After we we saw the last bull run uh, with Play to Earn and that didn't really phase out and we're still looking for the new meta, uh, if you will, right? There was a potential uh, model there with free to own and everything that came out of that, um, which today uh, isn't as uh, exciting as it was maybe a year ago. Um, and that is really uh, a cascade or a result of uh, the lack of liquidity and the lack of user growth that we're seeing in this market, right? Um, free to own uh, really relies on uh, a lot of um, excitement and a lot of activity around your core assets even prior to the game, right? At least the way it was implemented by Limit Break and a few other studios, a lot of those those assets are massively um, underwater uh, relative to the purchase price of the users, right? Uh, obviously, it started from free, so um, it can't uh, go negative on that. But uh, I think the actual metric that we should be measuring is when did the, the holders come in to, to these collections, right? Because most of the current holders didn't come in at the, the free price. They were buying on the secondary. So um, that you know presents a, a bunch of challenges of really how are you uh, controlling that uh, narrative, the expectation of your, of your owners, right? And how are you tying together the timelines of, of when you're actually going to ship an asset uh, to the market that is going to be speculative by design, right? Uh, people are going to come into it not knowing exactly what they're buying into, but for the potential that they see in the project, that she's the founding team, but then she's the game. Uh, but they're underwriting some kind of expectation in that uh, decision. And you need to try to live up to that, right? At the same time that uh, you're still trying to get uh, a game out, and that is challenging in itself, right? The uh, odds of, of success in the game bare bones is slim to none, right? We're talking single digit percentage of uh, success. And when you're adding uh, more pressure to that equation, right? More risk, more demands from users that potentially don't even care about the game. All they care is about, look, I have a bag and I want it to go up, right? Can can devs do something about this? Uh, then that dilutes uh, your, your focus, right? Then really who are your core stakeholders at, at the end of the day uh, becomes a question, right? Are we optimizing for the asset owners uh, as our first power users? Or no, are we optimizing for future players that potentially don't even know uh, who we are and what we're trying to do, but we'll find the game start, right? That audience overlap isn't uh, straightforward and it isn't a given. So I think a lot of web projects uh, suffer this uh, fog of war question of, who am I really building for, right? Is it the crypto native audience that today is probably less than 10K active users on crypto Twitter and actually actively trading NFTs? Or no, am I shooting for the millions of players that can potentially play this game when it's done, but that don't necessarily even care about the NFTs, right? That they don't get it, that they don't um, support it and potentially even have an allergic reaction, right? So there are uh, fundamental questions there to, to be resolved. Then. I think every project has to come to a, a 
point of view as to like who they're really building for. But you know that we're talking about uh, audiences with very different profiles. Um, so once you make that decision, I think it becomes very hard to please both and somehow manage to to fit in a web free game that is also mainstream or mass market ready, uh, solving all of the onboarding challenges, but even more importantly, the uh, economy challenges, right? So I think that's just a brief overview of some of the uh, sort of difficult choices that you navigate as, as a web free game startup. Um, and I think it's very tough to look at the market today and point at the successful case studies that have resolved those those issues in a sustainable, healthy way that uh, will be able to bridge the the gap between both sides, right? So, yeah, I think it's um, it's it's a tough one to to tackle, and it's far from from being resolved. And thinking again back to the challenge of uh, operating in the space is that it changes uh, so frequently, right? What was um, potentially the way to go three months ago might have changed, and we're recording this just as the market has kind of had a, a bounce back up, and we don't know what that means, right? Is this a signal that the market is uh, coming back, or is this just a temporary kind of relief moment? So operating within that uncertainty and, and knowing how to structure your roadmap and your team to how you're going to execute on on, on this um, on this intersection is is uh, is pretty hard. I think you very articulately just covered um, all of the the challenges, which I, I I think really goes back to this allergic reaction you mentioned uh, among gamers to the idea of Web three games. I, I think like the core of that, uh, I'll call it even hatred for some, is the speculative element. Uh, so given the fact that you're uh, continually investing and building in this space and, and we're investing in this space. Uh, do you think about any particular dependency as what will unlock uh, the mainstream, let's say, or just uh, kind of open the floodgates? Have people who previously said, I, I hate the Web3 gaming people, I hate Web3 games, I hate crypto in general being related to gaming, but I've changed my mind because of X. Um, does it have to be a particular game? Does it have, does it have to be a particular influencer? Uh, a a anyways, if you had to pick one, like what, what do you think uh, bridges the gap for, for us? Yeah, I, th I think it's a result of where in the funnel uh, do you place web-free elements, right? Do your assets get front-loaded into your audience and it becomes a pitch of how you can uh, make money and earn uh, some asset out of playing this game, which will instill kind of this mercenary mentality, will anchor all of your player motivations down to extrinsic factors? Or is it, you know, at the end of the funnel to your power users as a surprise out of their engagement and love of this game, right? For me, we just haven't had enough of the latter experiments where we had successful games at the very uh, bottom of the funnel with their whales, with their VIPs, include assets that reward them and uh, give that value exchange back uh, out of the thousands of hours and potentially thousands of dollars they spent at this game, right? I think that is a switch that happens very naturally once you adopt this almost like a gifting economy, right? Um, it's a loyalty uh, incentive for you to uh, keep uh, engaging with this game and remain as part of the player community. But the reverse, uh, for you to go asset first, uh, independent of audience, and starts skewing uh, a lot of the incentives out of the gate and skewing a lot of your metrics as well, which makes it incredibly hard to know, um, is this game uh, being adopted because people resonate with what we've been building or because they are facing this speculative uh, dynamic that we've kind of like built into the into this package, right? So. Whereas we've adopted this this latter model, which is audience first, followed by assets, right? First, let us let us find the power users that actually gravitate naturally to this game, that play it uh, for the very sake of it, and then we can think about what are the best ways to reward them for for their engagement. Yeah, love that approach. And 
if I were to just add one thing, kind of like from the investor side, having watched this over the last three years, we went through a, like a period of copycats. So people saw the success of Axie and there was like a fear of experimentation for a period of time. And that in itself set us back. And what we're seeing now is the realization that, hey, look, you have to go out and solve your own hard problems and you have to make your own bespoke models and you actually have to be a free thinker and develop um, these game economies and these things in your own vision. You can't just take somebody that's something that somebody else has done and just roll it out because that's not going to work. So finally, we're kind of in that period of like, we're going to see people try things and fail, but it's going to push the space forward. And that's what's needed ultimately. Um, I, I want to shift this into now for the win, aka FTW. Tell us a bit about the game. What genre would you classify it in? Are there any kind of comps out there that are familiar to other players that you know they might feel at home playing uh, for the win? Yeah, for sure. So uh, for the win is an RPG shooter. Um, it is uh, inspired originally. Uh, from Overwatch and, and Valorant, so it has this sci-fi thematic, and it is a hero-based uh, shooter. Uh, though right now we're extending out the RPG mechanics of the game as kind of uh, part of its USP, right? So the closest comp there is Destiny 2, um, and we're not trying to uh, completely uh, go all the way out and, into what Destiny has. It that would be quite impossible. It's a a game that's been in live service for a decade plus at this point. Uh, but we want to bring some of those uh, deeper RPG mechanics and the very core of its uh, progression design into this game, right? So a lightweight RPG shooter is the, the best way it can classify it. Uh, it has some elements uh, of original arena uh, shooter games, right? This smaller maps, optimizing for combat density and really fun, really fluid gameplay but with a metagame that is very orthogonal and very different to this day, which we think starts uh, approaching a new audience and also having a very different value proposition, right? The fact that it's not completely a competitive uh, base game. It's not all about uh, skill determining the, the leaderboards, but it incentivizes the consistency and the efforts and determination of your players, right? So it skews more towards grind heavy players that want to see constant and uh, engaging progress on their accounts, right? If they're willing to, to put in the time for it. Joao, th then can you start to talk about some of the Web3 elements you're uh, infusing into For the Win? Yeah, so very much like I was uh, speaking to before, uh, our vision or approach today is uh, this progressive ownership model, right? meaning that we first want to uh, focus exclusively on the game uh, without uh, implementing any Web3 elements because we actually think it would be detrimental uh, to the launch and to the early uh, phase of the project. Um, and uh, that is something that for us was an important decision that we made over the, the last few months that we uh, sat down with the team and we told the developers, this year, all we are focusing on is the product, right? How can we make this the best game possible? And then after we have that uh, proven foundation, then let, let us think together uh, on how to extend that potential, how to catalyze its success with Web3 embedded as part of the package, right? The thinking today for us is that Web3 is going to be more of the growth engine as opposed to a core monetization driver. So we want most of the revenue to be coming out of mobile free-to-play IP purchases. Uh, but we think there is an interesting uh, play of how we can actually lower uh, CPI and the customer acquisition costs through uh, very select implemented uh, NFTs as part, of the, as part of the game. And when we say NFTs, uh, we're not thinking necessarily tokenizing game assets, but we're really creating a layer on top uh, of the game. Right? So just like any game will have the very core uh, gameplay loop, will have the meta game on top of that. We're thinking a third layer on top of that, which is publisher uh, driven assets, right? So these assets are going to be issued and, and they're going to be branded uh, with Jungle uh, at the very center, right? Uh, it is 
for the early users and the early adopters of the community today. And it has a pass through uh, through the game, but we're not yet at, at a point where we have the full economy model uh, built out where we can start implementing certain um, assets in the game. So we think it is going to be very interesting to um, market these assets uh, related to, to Jungle and think of, of them as layers, right? As layers on top of the game. So uh, for us, we already have a few collections designed. Uh, they're not uh, in development and they're not released yet. And we're watching very closely the market uh, to be able to time the, the, the release of that, not only with uh, when the game is ready, but when the market uh, is is in a healthier healthier state. Yeah, I think that's a very sensible approach. And I, I was I was about to ask you that, but you just kind of answered my question. Like, how do you time that third layer? So if, if you're calling like core game loop is layer one, metagame is, is layer two, and then this like kind of like NFT web three uh, is layer three. How do you know when it's time to say, okay, we think the game is ready, but we also think the crypto market is ready and like, um, you know, attentions come back to that side. I mean, a lot of moving pieces there to kind of hit and time right. But um, it sounds like you're thinking through all of that. Um, if there's anything to add, feel feel free. Um, but I kind of also want to ask you about, um, so we talked about NFTs, but what about uh, tokens? And, and how do you think through uh, putting that into the game as well? Um, because that's, that's another piece, um, you know, that adds... I guess instability to the game economy, um, assuming that you know there is a volatile token attached to all this. Um, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, again, for us, uh, it was uh, very important to uh, separate which areas uh, we were going to be focusing on um, to to give clarity to the team. And it was really obvious to us at the start that tokens were going to be out of uh, the the focus zone uh, before we had. Uh, the game in a successful uh, state and uh, after we also implemented NFTs, right? So tokens are going to be your hardest uh, tool to, to, to get right, right? Uh, they're incredibly uh, efficient for incentive design because of the fungibility and being able to actually uh, separate out uh, which kind of user groups you want to incentivize and which you want to reward, right? And tie that with product metrics that um, tell you that these are the core stakeholders uh, of your community. But there's no going back, right? This is the the problem with tokens. The moment you've released it, it is very hard uh, for you to manage uh, a live token economy, uh, not just from a, a product perspective of including sufficient sync and having a uh, token loop that makes sense for the game and actually gives it utility. But really, uh, with the market, right? That is something that is very correlated to um, liquidity, to, to user growth, and to everything else that um, you know will inform your token price. So, uh, for us, that's still a few years out. We're not uh, actively discussing tokens uh, or any token systems uh, within the the company. Uh, but it is something that. Uh, at some point, we want to go back to and and, and assess. Um, so for now, just wait and see. Uh, Joao, what about tokens just as a payment? So like, imagine I'm playing for the win and uh, just like in any other game, I, I might, you know, buy certain ammo or skins or whatever. Uh, what about just the simple utility of being able to use like a stable coin or being able to use ETH? Um, versus paying with like a credit card. I feel like we're, we're all used to defaulting to that. Um, I, I don't want to downplay the fact that I personally would appreciate that just because of the fact that I transact so often in, in crypto. Um, and, and I guess if there's any other ideas, maybe there to expand upon. But yeah, I guess I'm, I'm thinking more about payments versus like a volatile native token that maybe acts as like a way to like share revenue, all, all the sorts of things that happen with uh with tokens yeah for sure so that's a very different model right tokens as payments of uh crypto that is already in the market and you're not issuing and then token as kind of like uh it's a monetary experiment and you 
currency that you're creating and giving kind of utility to. Um, it is definitely a weaker model because, yes, you can take payments in and you can sell that and you can book that as rev, but uh, you're not allowed all of the uh, benefits of uh, having control of your own currency and using that as incentives, right? So at that point, um, it becomes a question of how big is that opportunity, right? How big is that audience that has ETH, that has USDC, and wants to play your game and denominate their transactions in that in that currency. Uh, for us, looking at our audience, that is a very uh, small subset uh, of, of, of the uses we're targeting. So it's not high priority in, in the roadmap to implement. Though, uh, when we think about um, the possibility of having a very small cohort of power users, there are whales that uh, want to uh, transact in, in, in crypto. I think for, for sure it's an ex- it's an experiment that we want to run once the, the game is live. Uh, but as of now, th- there are no no plans for us to, to do that. So even though the this potential future token for For the Win could be like years out, or I, I don't know, maybe it would even be for Jungle in the future, uh, what design ideas do you like for uh, for the uh, let's say a native token for like a game, like what, what's something, uh, I don't know if you have any examples of games in the market that you, you really admire, uh, that are already live, uh, with a token, um, or just, you know, we can just talk hypothetically, like what, what kind of ideas might you implement if you were going to launch a token tomorrow? Yeah. No case studies active in the market come to mind. Um, I think, when we break down the two models uh, of the last cycle, right, the utility token and the governance token, both have their own challenges, and uh, um, it's potentially not yet a, a, a archetype that that we've cracked that is going to be sustainable and they're the dominant model for, for the next cycle, right? With utility, it was uh, really uh, the, the core issue was inflation, right? Uh, uh, once you're printing this token out of thin air and um, you're you know, issuing it constantly for your players. Uh, how do you actually maintain that uh, uh, the purchase uh, parity of the token, right? And how do you do it to actually give it some kind of value uh, is very unclear. And then with governance tokens, the, the very name of it is predicated on something that is incredibly hard to implement uh, from, from a game developer standpoint, right? What exactly are you going to give? Uh, the uh, token holder is governance over, right? Is it going to be some kind of high level decision of uh, the economy of the game? And how do you actually implement that in in, the, in a legal system that is uh, compliant is, is is a tough one uh, to, to get right. And I haven't seen any governance tokens that implement meaningful governance. And uh, on the other side, as a player, I haven't seen any actual demand from, from players to have more governance of, over over their game. So uh, I think it becomes hard to, to, to justify that that as well. I think when we were thinking about tokens for this game, a lot of what we wanted to get right is simply the uh, source of the token, right? The very origination uh, of the token being something that was deeply tied to the genre and to the core loop of the game, right? So when we were discussing this, it was what are the uh, indicators, what are the uh, the metrics in the game that a player has to to complete to start uh, this journey of token ownership, right? And again, it was something that was really exciting for its own design space, but the reality check is that a lot of the players that we're targeting um, simply don't understand it, they don't know how to value it, and they might even have some some um, drawback uh, associated with the moment you start talking about a token in game, right? And that's outstanding all of the challenges of actually implementing uh, that within a, a mobile app where you have some uh, regulation challenges and you have some um, legal risk uh, associated with that. So uh, it is, uh, I think, a, a fascinating uh, design space, uh, but it is something that we're not actively looking at simply again because of the the phase of the the project right now. Joel, um, when I think about like Web three gaming and like NFTs, um, to me, like an in game marketplace always comes to mind as 
uh, something that just kind of makes sense. You know, seeing other big gaming, like Web2 gaming marketplaces, like I used to play a lot of Madden and, you know, Madden Ultimate Team trading players or CSGO Marketplace or uh, Tarkov or something like that. Like, um, what, like what, if anything, do you think Web3 opens up with like a peer-to-peer kind of like marketplace? Um, and is there anything, any elements of a marketplace that you're thinking of building into for the win right now? Yeah, for sure. So a marketplace is is, is very different uh, than than the token conversation, and that is something that we're uh, more advanced in 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 our thinking, and particularly because of the uh, core loop and the meta game design that we're approaching, we think there is a, a solid opportunity there of uh, this model of pay to progress, and you can exchange um, your player loadouts and your accounts with other players, right? So uh, given that we're premising a lot of uh, the progression of, of this game in terms of how many hours and how many uh, missions you complete and how well you're performing in the game. At some point, I think the marketplace starts making a lot of sense for a, a player that just joined the game but is willing to uh, pay to advance uh, and get you know a leveled up character or a leveled up weapon from a player that potentially doesn't uh, want to use it anymore or is looking to switch their their loadouts, right? So uh, marketplaces for me uh, is uh, is an opportunity that we're going to be looking at very closely uh, once we have the, the new progression system uh, fully built out. And that is um, something that makes a lot of like organic and natural interest uh, for your player journey, right? So uh, for sure, it is uh, something we don't have yet good uh, comps of which type of marketplace we want to build. To what extent that is going to be in app on mobile versus taking you outside to a browser experience or this external game store, uh, but it is something that uh, we we think is going to add to the to the player experience. Uh, Joe, I was something uh, we haven't covered, and this was like one of I remember like the the major talking points about uh, Jungle and how you were going to go to market uh, with For the Win or any future games. So there was a very like specific geographic. Uh, focus and and that was uh, Latin America and Southeast Asia. I guess has anything changed in terms of uh, the ge- geographic distribution approach to For the Win or any like future games? A- and then maybe too you could um, help folks who uh, are uh, you know living in other parts of the world to just understand like why why did you focus on those geos or why are you more um, uh, intent to uh, introduce this game uh, to those regions of the world. Yeah, the summary view is that uh, these are the biggest underserved audiences in gaming today. Uh, if you look at simply the size of uh, the populations across Latam and Southeast Asia, and to some extent, we're also working closely uh, into Africa as a third core region for us. Um, it's very clear that most developers are not targeting. Uh, these markets and for very uh, solid reasons, which is lack of monetization, right? Uh, and you have tons of, of users in these countries, but historically they haven't monetized um, to to the same degree as tier one countries in the West. So that presents an interesting uh, opportunity for us, which is most shooter developers, most F- FPS developers simply are ignoring these audiences and their very product uh, specs and, and requirements uh, show that, right? And uh, for us, that is something that we're, we're looking uh, into as a blue space in, in a very saturated market that we can actually penetrate and we can have an advantage in if we're building natively for these audiences, right? And the reason, uh, once you start looking at it from uh, a market perspective, is that uh, these audiences sometimes are not just mobile first, they're mobile only, and uh, we're developing uh, the game to run extremely well and very efficiently in mobile. Uh, But also, when you look at Web3, these audiences um, are the ones that had the highest adoption curve and uh, usage uh, in the last cycle, right? So if you look at the breakdown of Axie and any other games, heavily concentrated in uh, Southeast Asia, had some spread over to Latam, and that was a core uh, demographic as well. So in the uh, last cycle where Web3 found some uh, sort of PMF, it was 
uh, in these regions. And we haven't seen any signal uh, to, to that effect in, in, in the West, right, in, in the U.S. or in Europe. So for us, it became very natural that uh, these are going to be our core users. And um, FPS games are a big uh, subset of uh, the games that they're looking for, right? If you look at Darina Free Fire, it's the biggest game in, in Brazil, and um, it, it comes out of Southeast Asia, and also other games that um, are there in the top 10 of these uh, regions, right? Like Cod, Cod End, for example. So that uh, that was the, the thought process, and uh, for us, it still remains uh, the, the target, uh, and that hasn't changed. Just along the lines of acquisition, looking out at the Web3 gaming landscape right now, I mean, it's pretty clear that uh, a lot of projects, teams are struggling to raise. Um, is there any, like, are, are you looking at all at any of these Web3 studios as p- potential acquisition targets? Maybe maybe ones with like really good tech stacks or is that off the menu right now for you? Or yeah, what are your thoughts on that? It is off the menu. Though we've been approached by a few uh, and, and have had interesting conversations, most of these uh, are not building for mobile, right? Uh, and, and and most of them have uh, a very specific audience that they were targeting uh, coming out of uh, Web3, right? And for us, looking at the, the size of that audience today uh, is simply not, not an interesting opportunity. Uh, it's more likely that uh, we're going to be acquiring other games from uh, Web2 studios uh, in the future, as opposed to the the current cohort of Web3 gaming companies. Joao, this is probably a good place for us to start to wrap up. So um, I want to remind our listeners to first go learn about Jungle. You can go to their website at itsjungle.xyz. Second, they can follow Jungle on Twitter uh, or X, whatever people call it now. It's uh, jungle underscore xyz. You can follow Joao on Twitter. Uh, his is, I'll flash it up here on screen, but it's 0xj010. Uh, and then I would love to close with you having the final word on just what we can look forward to in the next six to 12 months in terms of uh, jungle and, and upcoming milestones. Uh, and then more importantly, any insight you can give us into the release schedule for For the Win. Like, are there any playable alphas or betas coming up? For sure. Yeah, I can tackle both. Uh, in one go. So for the next six to 12 months, in the next six, uh, we're looking to approach a soft launch uh, with the game. So that by March, we should have a, a very solid uh, build that is going out to market. And uh, we're going to be doing some acquisition uh, related to that and user testing to be looking at retention. And after that, by 12 months, we should already be in the process of uh, she says building and execution for the second target. So that's what we have coming up. Uh, right now, the game is already in some form of, of live state. Uh, it is live in one particular country. I can't uh, review which one, uh, but we're already doing some early gameplay testing and uh, learning about uh, the users and getting feedback. So we're going to be doing play testing in small focus groups as well at, at some point. Uh, having an open beta with the community on Discord. So um, that is something we're super excited uh, about. We want to think of, of this next stage as where we actually start, uh, the, the rubber starts hitting the road and uh, we get a reality check and we start learning about the audience uh, on on actual um, uh, player activity, right? So yeah, uh, we're, we're finally uh, coming close to that point and by the next year, we, we're going to have a solid answer to, to the questions we've been asking ourselves. Hey, well, thank you again for coming on to talk with us. Um, at any time we get the chance to talk with you, whether it's on a podcast or or uh, not on a podcast, I just learned so much. Uh, so just really appreciate you taking the time to uh, share all your insights here. And uh, just really excited to play For the Win, uh, given some of the uh, the other games we've gotten to test with you previously. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. uh, Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod.